The snow under our boots crunched sharply as we trudged towards Station Polaris, the isolated Arctic research outpost where we were sent to investigate. The wind howled relentlessly, biting through our thermal suits and filling the air with a low, mournful wail that matched the stark emptiness of the frozen landscape. This wasn't the place for mistakes, but the station's sudden silence had dragged us here, hundreds of miles from anything resembling civilization. The research station, set up to collect data in the Arctic, went quiet, so we were sent to investigate. It could have been the result of the power going out, a problem with a communications array, or an encounter with wildlife. So, we had to prepare for anything. We set off, equipped for a long mission, with supplies to last us days. The station loomed ahead, its angular structure almost blending into the stark white surroundings. Solar panels glinted dully under the weak arctic sun, and the wind turbine blades creaked as they turned sluggishly. The comms array stood tall, perfectly intact. From the outside, everything seemed functional, yet we all knew that no one had heard a word from the researchers in weeks. Inside, the facility was eerily pristine. The lights hummed softly and the heaters were working perfectly. Supplies were neatly stacked in the pantry and the living quarters were immaculate. It felt like the crew could walk in at any moment, but the air carried a stale weight as though the building itself had been holding its breath. Then, we found them. Their bodies were huddled in the secure lab, the thick steel door latched from the inside. It took us a full hour to breach it, cutting through the locks with a plasma torch. When the door finally swung open, the scene was haunting. Four researchers were slumped against the walls, their gaunt faces frozen in twisted expressions of fear. Their lab coats were rumpled and stained, and deep scratches marred the walls and door. A few words were sprawled on the inside of the door in what looked like dried blood. Don't open. Their hands, raw and bloody, suggested desperate attempts to claw their way out, or maybe to keep something from getting in. The food stores were untouched, and the air recyclers were working perfectly, yet the cause of death was clear. Dehydration and starvation. They'd locked themselves inside, and never left. Cabin fever? Eliza, our biologist, whispered, her voice trembling slightly, despite her usual calm. Maybe they thought something was out there? I replied, glancing nervously toward the hallway. We found out, each of us taking a section of the station to begin our work. I focused on the comms array, which appeared functional, but was inexplicably offline. The software log showed no errors, as if someone had deliberately disabled it. The station's pristine condition clashed violently with the madness of the locked lab. Every door swung on oiled hinges, every panel gleamed under the fluorescent lights, and even the smallest tool was in its proper place. The perfection of the setting only made it feel more unsettling, the dichotomy of the situation painting a grim mystery to be solved. Then, there was the feeling. It wasn't something we could measure or explain, but we all felt it. A subtle, pervasive wrongness. The air seemed heavier inside, charged with an energy that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Even the wind outside seemed muted, as though the station absorbed every sound. It didn't help that the Arctic stretched endlessly beyond the walls, a blank canvas of snow and ice that could swallow us whole if we made the wrong step. But it wasn't the landscape that had me glancing over my shoulder. It was the silence inside. Something about it felt alive. I tried to focus on my tasks, 
but my mind kept circling back to the locked room, to those faces frozen in terror. What had they seen that drove them to such desperation? And what if it was still here? The question hung in the air like frost, unanswered and growing colder with each passing moment. The first few hours at Station Polaris were chaotic, a frantic attempt to make sense of the fragmented research left behind. Environmental readings from the station sensors were erratic, subtle, rhythmic vibrations in the air, logged at precise intervals. These weren't seismic in nature. The station's ground-penetrating radar showed no signs of tectonic activity. Instead, it was as if the air itself pulsed with energy, but only fleetingly. Every time we tried to pinpoint the anomaly, the readings vanished as quickly as they'd appeared. This doesn't make sense, Eliza said, poring over the data console. She tapped at the screen, frustration mounting. It's like the equipment's playing tricks on us. Could be interference from the storm outside, Mark offered, the team's communication officer, though his tone lacked conviction. He'd already noticed the radios crackling with faint static. Still, he wasn't ready to alarm us with the implications of it. The strangeness escalated within hours. While conducting inventory in the common area, Eliza froze mid-step. Did you hear that? Hear what? Mark asked, glancing up from the checklist. There was knocking from the other side of the main door, Eliza said, her voice wavering. Mark walked to the door, shining his flashlight into the white expanse beyond the narrow window. Nothing but the swirling void of the Arctic night greeted him. It's the wind, he said, though he didn't sound fully convinced. While exploring, I returned from inspecting the living quarters, pale as ice. I swear I heard my name, I muttered, but it wasn't you two, was it? No, Eliza replied quickly, her eyes darting to the shadows, flickering under the fluorescent lights, and I heard something else. Each of us reported hearing different sounds, muffled sobbing, distant tapping, voices murmuring indistinct words. None could verify what the others heard, and no auditory signals appeared on their monitoring equipment. The incongruity heightened the unease, as if the station itself were conspiring to disorient us. While searching the primary lab, I found a compartment hidden behind one of the equipment racks. Its lid was engraved with strange, almost geometric patterns, unfamiliar to any of us. Inside lay a crystalline object about the size of a grapefruit. It refracted light in unsettling ways, casting disoriented, shifting shadows on the walls. What is this? I murmured, reaching to touch it. Careful, Eliza warned, but curiosity got the better of me. As my fingertips grazed the object, a sharp jolt rippled through my hand. I pulled back, cursing. The room seemed to hum for a moment before falling silent. Did you feel that? Mark asked, rubbing his temples. He described a faint whisper, barely audible, that lingered in the back of his mind, like a half-forgotten memory trying to surface. The object's presence deepened our sense of foreboding. Attempts to analyze it proved fruitless. No material analysis equipment on site could identify its composition, and it emitted no radiation or heat signature. It was completely inert, yet profoundly wrong. Eliza suggested the previous team might have unearthed it nearby. Still, there was no mention of the object in the research logs. Whatever this is, she said, it isn't supposed to be here. Later that evening, 
we gathered in the comms room to send an update to the logistics crew. Mark activated the satellite relay, waiting for the encryption sequence to process. The screen displayed a reassuring green connection icon, which flickered and then went black. Not now, he muttered, rebooting the system. Static hissed from the speakers, followed by the faint hum of a transmission. For a brief moment, the green icon reappeared, only to be replaced by garbled static and a faint, rhythmic pulse. Mark tried to readjust the signal gain, but it was futile. Is it the storm? Eliza asked, but Mark shook his head. We've transmitted through worse weather. This feels... deliberate. The equipment continued to falter throughout the night. By morning, the comm system had failed entirely. I worked furiously and attempted a hard reset but achieved nothing. We're on our own, I finally admitted. As night descended, the whispers became louder and more insistent. Eliza tried to sleep but was jolted awake. She said it was a voice, a clear, commanding whisper that seemed to come from inside her room. Don't open the door, it said. But when she bolted upright, her door was shut and the room empty. In the mess hall, Mark sat alone, staring at his radio. He swore the static was speaking to him, patterns emerging in the crackles. Don't you hear it? He asked when I entered. Hear what? I asked. But before Mark could respond, the main hallway lights flickered, casting jagged shadows across the walls. For a split second, we all felt it. A crushing presence, like something immense and unseen was bearing down on us. The sense of being watched grew unbearable. By now, none of us doubted the previous researchers' writings on the door. The whispers gnawed at the edges of our sanity. Looking at the others, I was the steadiest among them, and I finally addressed the elephant in the room. Whatever's happening here, we can't stay. If we're not careful, we'll end up just like them. The air inside the station felt heavier with each passing hour. I couldn't shake the feeling that the walls were watching us. Eliza paced back and forth near the common area, her footsteps echoing unnaturally loud. This place is all wrong, she muttered, glancing at the reinforced windows. Mark stared out at the snow through one of the thick panes. Nothing but white. He said softly, almost to himself. No movement, no sign of life. It's just... nothing. I sat at the console, scrolling through the fragmented logs. There's nothing here that explains the last team's behavior, I said. No seismic anomalies, no animal sightings, no storms. Just normal readings. I felt the words catch in my throat because nothing felt normal here. Eliza stopped pacing to turn to me. Then what drove them mad? They scratched the doors to pieces, barricaded themselves inside, and starved to death. That doesn't just happen. I had no answer. That night, the station woke us with sounds. It started faint, scratching on the far wall, just loud enough to break through the silence. I sat upright in my bunk, heart pounding. At first, I thought it was the wind. Then came the banging, sharp and deliberate, like something heavy striking metal. Eliza, did you hear that? I whispered, grabbing my flashlight. Yeah, she said, her voice trembling. It might just be... I don't know ice shifting? Mark had already slid out of his bunk and was standing in the doorway, staring down the hallway toward the source of the sound. 
that's not ice, he said flatly. The banging came again, this time louder, closer. I jumped, my flashlight beam chittering against the wall. We gathered in the common area, clutching whatever we could find. Eliza grabbed a fire extinguisher. I held a wrench. Mark had his flashlight gripped like a weapon. The noise moved, circling the station. It came from the walls, then the roof, then the floor. Each sound was precise and deliberate, like it was searching for a weak spot. It's testing us, Eliza said, her voice barely above a whisper. It's trying to find a way in. When dawn came, if you could call it that in the Arctic, the banging stopped. The station fell silent, but the tension in the air didn't fade. Mark suggested we check the perimeter and see if something left tracks, but I immediately vetoed the idea. We don't know what's out there, I said. It could be anything. Like what? A polar bear? Mark snapped. Polar bears don't knock in patterns, Eliza shot back. Whatever it is, it's not an animal. We barricaded the doors and windows. Every logical part of me knew we were trapping ourselves inside, but I couldn't bring myself to suggest otherwise. The noises, whatever was out there, had made that choice for us. The second night was worse. The scratching became relentless scraping, like claws dragging against the walls. The banging came back, harder and more chaotic, shaking the station to its core. It's going to break through, Eliza whispered, clutching the fire extinguisher like a lifeline. Mark sat at the console, staring at the monitors. There's nothing, he said, his voice shaking. The cameras show nothing. It's just us out here. Then what the hell is making that noise? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. I don't know, Mark snapped, slamming his fist on the console. The banging immediately responded, echoing louder, sharper, almost angry. We all froze. It heard that, Eliza said softly. It heard him. By the third day, we were all exhausted. Every step felt like trudging through wet cement. Eliza slumped in a chair, her face pale. I can't think straight, she said, her voice barely audible. Yeah, Mark agreed, his head in his hands. I need more sleep. It's like my energy's just gone. I rubbed my temples trying to fight off the pounding headache that had been building all morning. The artifact. I didn't want to admit it, but I knew it was somehow involved. It could be the artifact, I said finally, putting the idea out there. We should throw it outside, Mark muttered. And risk leaving the station, I asked. Do you hear that? The banging had started again, now accompanied by a low, almost mechanical groan. The third night, everything reached the fever pitch. The station shook with the force of the banging, and the scraping became a deafening screech. Eliza dropped to her knees, covering her ears. It's in my head, she screamed. It's in my goddamn head. Mark grabbed his flashlight and bolted toward the far hallway. We can't just sit here and wait to die. I'm gonna kill it, he shouted, his flashlight beam cut through the darkness, landing on the door at the far end of the station. The banging stopped. Mark, don't... I started, but he was already at the door, his hand trembling as he reached for the handle. The silence was deafening. It's quiet, he whispered, his voice cracking. Eliza and I rushed forward, getting ready to grab him. Don't open it, I yelled. It's a trap. 
Mark hesitated, his hand still inches from the handle. Then, the banging resumed, louder than ever, as if mocking us. We stumbled back to the common area, the sounds chasing us, filling the station with chaos. The station wasn't just falling apart, we were. By the fourth day, the noises had escalated to a maddening cacophony, banging, scratching, and now an eerie, rhythmic thumping that echoed deep within the walls. The air inside felt like it was pressing against my skull, and every glance exchanged among us seemed to carry unspoken accusations. Mark and Eliza sat opposite ends of the common area, glaring at each other. I stood between them, exhausted from trying to keep the peace. We can't keep doing this, I said, my voice hoarse from days of shouting over the sounds. We need to work together, or we're not going to make it. You want to talk about working together? Eliza snapped, her eyes blazing. Mark's the one who almost opened the goddamn door. I was trying to figure out what we're dealing with, Mark shot back, slamming his fist on the table. Sitting here, hiding, isn't solving anything. Enough, I barked, slamming the wrench I'd been clutching onto the table. The sound reverberated through the station, momentarily drowning out the noises. For a brief moment, everything was silent. Then, as if in retaliation, the banging resumed. Harder. Angrier. Mark stood up. You said it was the artifact. If it's causing this, why haven't we gotten rid of it? Because it's the only thing keeping us alive, she yelled back. You think these noises are bad? Imagine what happens if we just throw it out there with... with whatever's out there. It must want it. I turned to Eliza, raising my hands. We don't know that for sure, but right now we can't risk... The crash of shattering glass cut me off. My heart stopped as I turned and saw Mark standing over the console, a chair raised in his hands. He'd smashed the screen, shards of glass glittering on the floor. Smoke rose from the panel as sparks danced across its surface. What the hell are you doing? I shouted, lunging for him. I grabbed his arm and yanked him back as the equipment groaned and fizzled. He wasn't doing anything, he screamed, his voice cracking. He wasn't calling anyone, it wasn't helping. It's just another useless piece of junk, like all of you. Smoke poured out from the console as the last of its lights flickered out. The satellite uplink was fried and the backup comms were destroyed. We were completely isolated now with no way to call for help or even confirm if rescue was coming. You've doomed us, Eliza shrieked, her voice shaking with rage and panic. She shoved Mark, sending him tumbling backward. Do you even understand what you've done? I did what I had to, Mark spat, clutching the chair like a shield. None of this was working. We're on our own whether you like it or not. Now we can finally focus on the here and now. I stood between them, my body tense, my mind racing. We needed that console, now we have nothing left. Mark turned to me, his face pale and eyes bloodshot. Nothing? We've had nothing since we got here, Reed. The noises aren't stopping, the artifact isn't doing anything, and now we're just sitting ducks. You want to die locked in here like those researchers? The words hung in the air like frost, chilling us all. I saw Eliza's face crumble as the gravity of our situation sank in. Mark lowered his chair, his rage deflating to quiet despair. But it was too late. The noises stopped. For a moment, the station fell into an oppressive silence, the kind that made my ears ring. Then came a sound worse than any banging or scratching. A low, guttural moan, 
vibrating through the walls and deep into my bones. It's trying to get in, she whispered. It's going to break through. No, I said firmly, though my own fear was clawing at my throat. It's not going to get in. It hasn't gotten in yet, and it won't now. We just have to hold out. Why do you keep saying that? Mark demanded, stepping closer. His face was pale, his eyes bloodshot. You don't know that. For all we know, it's already inside. It's not inside, I insisted, my voice rising. But it will be if we start losing it like the last team did. Mark froze at that, his face darkening. You think we're like them? He hissed. You think we're just going to sit here and starve ourselves to death like they did? Mark, calm down, I said, stepping back. No, he shouted. You're just as bad as they were, refusing to face the truth. There's something out there, and if we don't deal with it... The lights flickered again, and the temperature plummeted. Frost began forming on the windows, creeping inward. The artifact's glow pulsed erratically, casting wild shadows on the walls. The banging reached a fever pitch, drowning out Mark's words. Mark lunged for the artifact. If we're going to die here, I'm not going to sit here and... Eliza tackled him before he could reach it, both of them collapsing to the floor in a heap. The wrench fell from my hand as I rushed to pull them apart, but the moment my fingers touched Mark's arm, I felt it. The same draining sensation I'd felt near the artifact, only stronger. Stop it! I yelled, yanking him back. He shoved me off, breathing heavily, but didn't move toward the artifact again. The groaning noise didn't stop. It pulsed through the station. Mark and Eliza clung to each other, as if their sheer presence could hold the station together. I stayed where I was, gripping my wrench, my mind racing to make sense of it all. But then... I noticed something odd. My coffee mug. It sat on the table, untouched since the morning, but the liquid inside was perfectly still. No ripples, no trembling surface. Eliza, I croaked, pointing to the mug. Look at this. She didn't move, her hands pressed to her ears. Mark shook his head, his back pressed to the wall. Not now, Reed. We need to figure out how to survive whatever the hell that is. Eliza? Mark? I said louder, standing up and pointing more firmly at the mug. The sound. It's not real. They both froze, looking at me like I'd lost my mind. What are you talking about? Eliza said her voice tight. You can feel it. I grabbed the mug and held it up. This should be shaking. Everything should be vibrating, but nothing in this room is reacting to the sound, except us. Mark's eyes darted to the mug, and for a moment, doubt flickered across his face, but it was quickly replaced by defiance. That doesn't mean anything, Maybe the noise is coming from inside. Maybe the whole structure is shifting. Then why haven't we felt a single tremor? Why are the vents still circulating air without a hitch? My voice was growing louder, fueled by desperation. The noises are in our heads. Whatever is causing this, it's keeping us trapped here. Keeping us afraid. Eliza shook her head violently, her fingers tightening around her temples. That doesn't make sense. What about the artifact? The noises started after we found it. How can you say this isn't real? It is real, I said. But only in here. I tapped the side of my head. It's making us paranoid. It made the researchers paranoid enough to lock themselves in that lab and starve to death. And it's doing the same thing to us. Mark stared at me his face pale but resolute. So what? 
You think we should just open the door and stroll outside? Let whatever's out there finish us off? Yes, I said, surprising even myself with the strength of my conviction. That's exactly what we need to do. If we stay here, it will wear us down until we're like them. Those bodies aren't warnings. They're proof of what happens if we don't get out. Eliza backed away, her eyes wide. You're insane. You want to open the door to whatever's been banging and growling? You want to kill us all? No, I want to survive, I shouted. If we stay here, we end up like them. Don't you see? The sounds, the artifact. It's all a trap. It's making us seal ourselves inside, just like they did. Mark stepped forward, his fists clenched. And what if you're wrong? What if we open that door and whatever's out there tears us apart? How are you so sure this isn't just cabin fever or some kind of environmental thing? I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. Because I feel it. The moment I realized the sound wasn't real, it stopped for me. The whispers, the banging, I don't hear them anymore. But you do, don't you? It's still in your head, pushing you to stay. Eliza was trembling, her back pressed against the wall. Even if you're right, Reed, we can't take that chance. We're not opening that door. Mark stepped between me and the entrance, his stance rigid. You're not going to let that thing in. You want to go out there? Fine. But you're not dragging us with you. The tension in the room was unbearable. The air thick with fear and mistrust. I gritted my teeth, my gaze shifting between them and the sealed door. The banging started again, or at least I assume so, from how they reacted as if it knew what I was about to do, making them more defensive and ready to hold the line at the door. Get out of my way, I said quietly. Mark shook his head. Over my dead body. Eliza's hand gripped my arm like a vice. He's right. You don't know what's out there. I shook her off, my mind racing. What I do know is whatever's out there hasn't broken in. Not yet. And if I'm right, then we've been locking ourselves in here for no reason, just like the last team. You're gambling all our lives on some... theory? What if you're wrong? Mark stepped closer, blocking my path to the door. His body was trembling. I might be, I admitted, my voice cracking. But look at us. We're not going to survive here much longer anyway. The power's unstable. We've lost comms. The cold's creeping in. If we stay, we die. Mark's jaw tightened. Better than opening that door and letting whatever's out there tear us apart. Eliza stood behind him, wide-eyed, shaking her head. Please, read. Don't do this. Their fear was palpable, their desperation infectious. And yet, so was mine. The scratches, the banging, none of it left any evidence. Every sound vanished into the void, leaving nothing but frayed nerves in its wake. I glanced at the faint bloodstains near the lab's door where the previous team had met their end. They hadn't opened the door. They'd listened to the whispers. And they died because of it. I stepped closer to the door, heart hammering in my chest. The control panel blinked steadily, a quiet rhythmic reminder that I held the power to end this madness. Or to doom us all. You're insane, Mark hissed. I heard him lurch forward and felt the impact as he grabbed my shoulder and yanked me away from the panel. I twisted out of his grip, shoving him hard enough to make him stumble. The sound of his boots scraping against the floor echoed loudly in the still air. 
He caught himself and turned back to me, rage flashing in his eyes. Don't make me stop you, he said, his voice trembling. I stared him down, my hand creeping back toward the panel. I don't think you can. Mark lunged at me again, this time with more force. I managed to sidestep him, slamming my back against the wall near the panel. Eliza cried out behind him, her voice cracking as she begged both of us to stop. But the door's blinking red light held my focus. I swung my arm out, swiping the control panel with the heel of my hand. The red light blinked once, twice, and then turned green. No! Mark roared, diving at me. But it was too late. The sound of the lock disengaging was deafening in the eerie silence. The door shuddered, its seals releasing with a hiss of escaping air. Eliza screamed, scrambling to grab Mark, who was clawing his way toward me as if to undo what I'd just done. I braced myself, every muscle locked in anticipation. The noise inside the station didn't stop. It collapsed. The incessant banging, scratching and whispers vanished instantly, replaced by the howling wind and the Arctic's suffocating stillness. The transition was so abrupt, it felt like stepping from a nightmare into nothingness. No shadowy figures, no claw marks, no monstrous forms, just the stark, blinding white of the snow and the faint howl of the wind. I exhaled, my breath fogging the air in front of me. It's empty, I whispered. Mark froze mid-step, his face a mask of disbelief. Eliza slumped to her knees, her hands covering her face. For a moment, we all stood there, staring into the unbroken expanse of snow. The silence was crushing, not a single sound echoing back from the icy void. There's nothing, I whispered, my words stolen by the wind. Mark looked at me, his face pale and drawn. You don't know that, he muttered weakly, his voice hollow. I stepped toward the open door, the cold biting into my skin. Then, why did it stop? He had no answer. Neither did I. Eliza stepped forward, her arms wrapped tightly around herself. Her face was pale, her eyes wide as she scanned the empty expanse. So, what? We imagined it? All of it? No, I said, my voice trembling but resolute. Not imagined. It was real, just not the way we thought. Mark snapped. You don't know that. He could be hiding. You could have killed us. His voice cracked, raw with anger and fear. We don't know what's out there. We don't... He faltered, his gaze drawn to the stark, unbroken snow. The reality began to sink in. The artifact, dull and inert in the corner, caught my eye. His presence felt heavier now, an ominous void sucking in light and reason. I gestured toward it. It was never out there, I said. It was always here. That thing, whatever it is, wanted us locked in, panicking, tearing each other apart. And we almost gave it what it wanted. Mark's face twisted in denial, but Eliza's expression softened. She looked back at the artifact, her brow furrowing. The other team, she murmured, her voice almost lost in the wind. That's why we found them like that, with no sign of escape. I nodded, grimly. I stepped fully outside, letting the arctic cold claw at my face grounding me 
in its unrelenting reality. Behind me, Mark slumped into a chair, shaking his head in disbelief. Eliza stood at the threshold, her expression a mixture of relief and devastation. Mark remained inside as we began to salvage what we could, avoiding our gaze. His distrust was palpable. There was nothing I could say to ease it. We were alive, but we'd barely escaped with our sanity intact. The whispers didn't return, but the artifact remained in the corner of the lab. Every time I looked at it, I felt a faint unease, like it was still watching, waiting. Even though the arctic wind roared around us, the silence inside the station had never felt louder. Evacuation finally arrived two days later. A helicopter's distant hum sliced through the icy silence, the sound alien after the oppressive stillness we had endured. By then, we'd clear the station of what we could. Notes, data, anything that didn't feel tainted by the artifact. Mark stayed withdrawn, barely speaking a word since the door had opened. He avoided looking at Eliza or me, his eyes lingering on the artifact, as though it was still whispering to him. I caught him pacing in front of it late at night, his face blank but his movements frantic, like he was arguing with himself. As a group, we decided to hide the artifact away from the facility in an unmarked location so that even we couldn't find it. We had witnessed what it could do in the most remote location from civilization. We didn't dare imagine what it could do in a populated area. When the research team arrived, they asked about the station's state. I told them we had lost their equipment and that the previous crew had succumbed to madness. I didn't mention the artifact, and neither did Mark or Eliza. Back at the main base, I tried to write my report. Facts, observations, timelines. I stuck to the tangible, but the words felt hollow. How could I describe something so intangible, so invasive, without sounding insane? Eliza sat across from me, staring at her own blank page. Finally, she sighed and leaned back, her eyes hollow. Are we supposed to pretend it didn't happen? She asked. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Mark refused to leave his quarters. He hadn't spoken since we boarded the helicopter. His door remained locked, the faint hum of his portable radio the only sign he was inside. I wondered if he still heard the whispers. Back in civilization, I tried to move on. Eliza transferred to a quieter project in a warmer climate, far from the Arctic. Mark disappeared entirely. Rumors floated among colleagues. He'd left the field, joined some obscure sect, or simply vanished. None of them felt right. None of them felt wrong. And me? I stayed. I couldn't let go of what we'd found. Or what had found us. I researched phenomena like it, buried in obscure archives, piecing together scraps of folklore and fringe science. Each time I read about strange sounds, mass paranoia, or unexplainable events, my thoughts returned to the artifact, to the whispers, to the door. <laughs>